A lot of people have asked me why I wrote this book. And as some of you know, I am a psychotherapist now. Well, people ask me why I became a psychotherapist. I said I worked with so many crazy people in the music business, I had most of the training that I needed. And I had this client who asked if he could bring in some of his favorite music into one of our sessions because, because he thought that it would enable him to contact some deeper feelings. And it did do that, but we didn't know what it was going to do to me. By the middle of the first song, I had tears streaming down my face. Now this was strange, I didn't know what these feelings were really all about. It wasn't sadness, exactly. And then I noticed that over the next several days, memories of my early days in the biz started flooding back for me. And I thought this had something to do with, what the, feel, with, with the feelings that came up for me. And so I decided to write down these stories to try to figure out what I was feeling. And I got through most of these stories and I still didn't understand the feelings. And then I had one last memory. There was this guy at A&R whose name was Milton Brooks, but we called him Broadway Max. Does anybody remember Broadway Max? Now Broadway Max was the most unusual character you would ever find at a hip Midtown recording studio. Max always wore the same shiny black suit with dandruff on his shoulders. He had yellowing teeth and a yellowing shirt. He always wore the same stained red tie. Always carried an umbrella, no matter the weather. Max came from Minneapolis, and he was supposed to inherit his father's haberdashery store. But as soon as he could get on that Minneapolis to New York train, he came to the Great White Way. That was Broadway Max's world, 42nd Street to 59th Street on the west side of Manhattan. Max was the Yoda of the studio. He took all of us young schleppers under his wing. He took me to the theater and turned me on to great literature. And when things got really crazy in the studio, I'd go up to Max's office for a little respite. He was my shelter from the storm. And one day, after I'd suffered some horrible humiliation at the hands of Paul Simon, who could occasionally be a little prick. Paul, are you here tonight? I don't think so. I went up to Max to tell him the story. And he listened sympathetically while chewing on the stove with an unlit cigar. He nodded and listened. And when the story was done, he said, yeah, so? And I said, yeah, so he, he can't do that. And at that point, Max burst into laughter. Anybody remember Max's beautiful demonic laugh? That was such a great laugh. And I didn't understand what he was laughing about. But then all of a sudden, I saw myself as I am today, sitting in Max's chair, looking at that kid that I was then. And then I understood what the laughter was about. You see, Max was like a sage. He had this amazing top-down view. And he knew that this was our one spin on the turntable. This was our one opportunity in all of eternity to be at the center of the universe, the New York music scene of the 1970s. This was Max's jungle, and he loved every second of it. The lunacy, the pain, and the glory, because it sure was better than selling handkerchiefs. And then I understood what my feelings were about. I felt remorse and gratitude and grief. You see, beyond the sex and the drugs and the egomaniacal superstars, what the scene was really about was you, the studio cats, the people behind the scenes who were so much a part of the great records that we made at that time. Everyone who worked in the scene put their full heart into it. Everyone from Ramon to the producers and arrangers and musicians and engineers and assistants, 
down to the people who answered the telephones and made the tape copies, all of them were impeccable. You people are the real heroes of my story because your generosity, your goodness, and your egolessness was so beautiful in a world that celebrated and unfortunately still celebrates jerks. I felt remorse because I never fully appreciated the extraordinary gifts I received when you people opened your hearts and welcomed me into this music world. I never properly said thank you and I never properly said I love you. And so that's the secret reason that we're doing this gig tonight. So I could get all of you in one room together at the same time and say thank you and I love you. I feel so much gratitude that I have these memories and I got to share these incredible experiences with you. And I feel grief because let's face it, the scene is over. It's gone, never to return like our youth. And I miss it. I miss it in the core of my being. Everybody who is a part of that scene, we share an ineffable bond. For many of us, these were the greatest moments of our lives. We were in the presence of history, and some of us made history ourselves. Like Don Covey, we made history. Now, back in the studio, you could always do one more take. And I wish life was like that. I wish I could go back and do one more take, but you can't, none of us can. But if I could, I would just be there for every moment, and I would have been a nicer guy. You know, on my first day in the studio, I learned that lesson from Nick Domino, that you never say no to a rock star. And what that means is you have to care all the way, no matter the cost, and no matter the outcome. So no matter what life brings up for me, my only answer is going to be, yes! I can't believe I just did that. Thank you, everybody.